Hi folks, this is Dan Bowen with a text-to-speech reading of Research Ballooning by New York University College of Engineering, 1959. Many experiments are best performed in the upper atmosphere. A large percentage of these will be carried aloft by balloons. Students encountering the science of ballooning for the first time may know little about its history, techniques and potentialities. This booklet is designed to provide such an orientation for the students entering the Cosmic Ray Project at New York University. Students elsewhere who make use of balloons may also find this summary of ballooning enlightening. This is not a technical manual giving exact directions for carrying out flights. In most cases the problems of getting a balloon flight into the air, tracking it and recovering it are entrusted to train flight crews working for the balloon manufacturer. In any case, the precise details of balloon flying are always changing as improved methods are developed. It is not the detail, but the overall picture that is useful to the novice designing an experiment for the upper atmosphere. Further, when the experiments has given over his instruments to the flight crew, knowledge of what they are doing may give him a feeling of confidence. The properly curious scientist should also stake pleasure in understanding the theory of balloon flight, A and D, T H E engineering O F C A R R Y I N G O T H I S flight even though neither has A D I R E C T bearing on H I S experiment. Chapter 1 The Story of Free Ballooning 1A Introduction the free balloon has provided science with an immensely useful means for reaching the Earth's atmosphere since the early days of its existence. The various techniques used to put the balloon where it is most useful and to convey the information it gains back to Earth form the subject of this manual. It shall be our purpose here to describe the problems and procedures of operating such research vehicles, reviewing those which have been found successful and to give a brief summary of the theory which governs their flight. Since automatically recording instruments did not exist in the early days of the balloon's history, most scientific measurements were made by people watching and recording the readings of the instruments. Yet the necessity of sending people aloft to perform this function was perhaps the severest limitation to the early development of ballooning. While a thermometer weighs less than a pound, the man to read it weighs over a hundred pounds, and requires an elaborate and heavy arrangement for survival. A large and expensive balloon is needed to lift man and equipment. The rate of acquisition of knowledge was greatly increased as automatic recording, instruments became equals available equals making possible the launching of many small balloons instead of a few large ones. Although the spectacular and imagination-stirring aspects of man entering a new region provided the stimulus which has led to the development of the present-day balloon, we shall, after a brief survey of the balloon's glamorous history, go on to consider it only a tool for research. 1b. Riley History of Free Ballooning Although the Mongol Phi A brothers are credited with making the first balloon, they were by no means the first ones to hit upon the thought of achieving flight by filling containers with something lighter than air. The history of this idea starts with the monk, Albert of Saxony who reasoned that since fire floats above the atmosphere, in the Aristotelian view, if fire could be enclosed in a light hollow globe, it too would float. As time went on more practical ideas appeared and we find the 17th century Lena actually calculating the dimensions of the four evacuated copper spheres which were to hold his aeronautical machine aloft. There is some evidence that the Portuguese Gussab got a balloon into air as early as 1709, although this is not well authenticated. There is no question that by 1767 Joseph Black had a practical system for a balloon. During a public demonstration he filled a light animal membrane with hydrogen, expecting it to rise. When, for reason, this experiment failed he never repeated it, thus allowing Cavallo, 1782, to be the first to send hydrogen-filled objects, soap bubbles in his case, into the air. The Mongol Phi A borders were the sons of a papermaker in Nene, a town about 40 miles from Lyons. It was Joseph the elder, 
who first thought of enclosing a cloud eye in a bag, a small silk bag which he held over a fire. When the bag was released it rose to the ceiling. Buoyed up by this success the brothers made a linen paper globe, 105 feet in circumference, which was ready for a public demonstration in June, 1783. When it was filled with hot air from a straw fire the balloon rose into the air where right he stayed for 10 minutes. As soon as he heard of this exploit Professor Charles, Charles Law, lost no time in trying to repeat it, using hydrogen which he had to generate by the action of dilute sulfuric acid upon iron filings, to inflate the balloon. Charles' balloon, which was released on August 27, 1783, stayed in the underscore air. A remarkable three quarters of an hour, underscore and underscore traveled 15 miles landing finally in a field where peasants set upon and destroyed what they thought was a devil from the sky, exorcism having proved useless. Shortly after this the Montgolfiers staged another demonstration, this time at Versailles where they send up a balloon lavishly decorated with royal ciphers and other embellishments to please the king and the court. Not only did this balloon set a fashion so that the early aerostats were marvelous to see, but the flight itself was noteworthy in that it carried passengers, not humans however, the safely accomplished travels of a sheep, a cock and a duck suggested that human beings might go aloft. After preliminary tests from a moored balloon two men, the later de Rosier and the Marquis Starlandes rose from the ground on November 21, 17,832 in a Montgolfier or hot air balloon. Ten days later Charles and one of his assistants floated 27 miles in one of his Charlie liars, ballooning quickly became a fad. Underscore one person estimated that by 1838, 171 persons had made a sense, most of these people made more than 1611 for a flight. The English Channel was crossed by a balloon in 1785. In 1836 a balloon piloted by Charles Green traveled about 500 miles from England to Nassau, a duchy in Germany. This balloon became famous as the Nassau Balloon. The first casualty in the history of ballooning occurred when Rosier, with a M. Roman, attempted to cross the English Channel in a Jupiter balloon of his invention consisting of a Montgolfier tied below a Charlie lyre. The obvious happened. Both passengers died. Though many trips made and records broken by balloons are too numerous to mention. The use of coal gas instead of hydrogen to inflate the balloons, initiated by Green in 1821 gave a great underscore impetus to ballooning since this gas 6 was cheap and readily available at gas mains. Nor was it appreciably heavier than the impure hydrogen which resulted from the crude acid filings generation. Although Russian claims to priority in scientific fields may not always be justified, they were then, as now, first in space research. Sakharov in 1804 brought this distinction to Russia by making an ascent in a hydrogen balloon during which he collected samples of air at the altitude he reached, and measured the magnetic field there. He carried a unique navigation instrument a telescope pointed at he ground in August of at the ground. The same year Galisac and Bio measured the temperature and humidity of the air at various heights as well as the magnetic field. The Nassau, piloted by the now famous Charles Green was used as a base from which to take measurements in the upper atmosphere, nothing new was revealed by the observations. Between July, 1862 and May, 1366 the aeronaut Coxwell and the scientist Glacier made 28 ascents under the auspices of the British Association for the Advancement of Science, they measured temperature, humidity, magnetic field and the constitution of the air. The chief military application of the free balloon was for reconnaissance. It was used for this purpose by the French during the Battle of Fleurus, 1794 between the French and the Austrians, and later in the Battle of Solferino, 1859, France versus Italy. During the American Civil War, McClellan's army had a balloon staff to it consisting of about 50 soldiers, 16 horses to draw the generators and acid cart, and two balloons. 
A more famous military role was played by balloons during the 1870-1871 siege of Paris when communication between the city and the rest of the world was had only by 64 balloons which airlifted messages and personnel out of the city. A reconnaissance balloon was used also in the Spanish-American War by the Americans, it is said to have helped the Spanish by giving information about the American position as much as it helped the Americans. Most recent were the Japanese incendiary balloons which floated over from Japan to the American West Coast where they started fires. It is with pleasure that we realize, however, that the free balloon has really very little direct military usefulness, and only when it is fitted with rudder and engines can it be used for destruction. Underscore one c other techniques for upper air exploration underscore there are a number of other techniques used to probe the upper air, all of which have been used, and each of which has both advantages and disadvantages. We shall briefly review them here for completeness. First, there are man-carrying kites. It will be recalled that Alexander Graham Bell, the inventor of the telephone, experimented with such devices about a half century ago. He was able to design kites which would sustain the weight of a man, and successfully floated these at various altitudes up to several hundred feet. Lighter kites have been flown to higher elevations. Obviously a wind is necessary, since kites depend on air passing over their surfaces to derive the force necessary for their support. Kites are therefore entirely suitable in case it is desired to float an instrument for a long period at an altitude of perhaps a thousand, dash, feet or so. However, for greater altitudes the weight of the line becomes excessive and kites do not promise well for the kinds of altitudes with which we are here concerned. Second is the airplane. Airplanes available commercially today are able to remain at altitudes of the order of 30,000 to 40,000 feet for periods of 10 to 12 hours. Certain types of military airplanes will be able to better this, and can fly at altitudes of the order of 50,000 feet for substantial periods. The B-70 bomber should be ready. By 1962, and IS to cruise at 70,000 feet at 2,000 miles per hour, the North American X-15 should F underscore reach 100 miles and fly at 4,000 miles per hour The loads which such planes can carry are considerable. The Lars, Erpleries with the especially large fuel tanks being able underscore to lift more than a ton of instruments. However, the planes which hold the really high altitude records are all small fighter types, which are at their ceilings only for minutes and which could carry only at the most a few hundred pounds of instruments as load. The larger planes also have high enough speeds so that appreciable parts of the Earth's surface can be spanned and measurements such as latitude effect can be made 7 gs, with their aid. However, the cost of such flights is considerable, as the fuel alone consumed by a large plane runs to the order of a ton per hour. Rockets represent the next method of attaining high altitudes. Here single-stage vehicles have gone up to altitudes of the order of 150 miles, and two-stage devices up to 250 miles. Multi-stage devices are required for experiments over 300 to 400 miles. The main problem up to the present time has been the short time which these devices stay at high elevations. Usually for a rocket which is going to between 100 and 250 miles, IT is at altitudes above, let us say, 20 miles for a matter of 2 or 3 minutes. This imposes a severe limitation on the kinds of experiments which can be carried out since the data must be gathered in a short time. Further, rockets are severely limited in both the weight and the volume of the instruments they can carry. The equipment must be very rugged to withstand the accelerations, and must be adaptable to telecommunications technique 6 for transmission of the data, since recovery of anything except the most rugged equipment is difficult. Other types of rockets are presently being improved, which enter a stable orbit at elevations of 300 miles or more, with much longer times at altitude. These devices are suitable for exploration of the ranges above balloon altitudes. However, the problem of cost must be considered, 
since the fuel requirements alone are considerable, as well as the complex control equipment necessary. A fuller discussion of these devices is outside of the scope of the present report. Finally we have the high altitude mountain research stations. These are listed in the JCARS report, and as of 1952, there were over 50 in operation or building. High altitudes are defined as above 7,500 feet, and the highest at the time of this writing is that at some 17,500 feet in Bolivia. Since the majority of such stations have electric power, and are accessible by a road, it is possible to operate equipment there for as long as one wishes to, and there is no limit to the weights of the instruments thus used. To go much above 17,500 feet level will at once get one into serious problems. Not only is it hard for observers to work, and to acclimatize at altitudes above say 22, Oh, 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 feet, but also there are very few mountains above 20, oh, 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 underscore feet that are not heavily glaciated, and that do not provide serious difficulties to the construction of a road or to the problem of keeping it open. Individuals can carry equipment higher, but in underscore this case one is limited to the weight that a party underscore of reasonable number of porters can carry. One also has the problem of bringing up the power supplies, for transmission lines in regions of ice storms would be difficult and expensive and large electric generators are heavy, dash underscore 1D. Altitude records in manned and unmanned balloon flights Both manned and unmanned balloons have attained altitudes in excess of underscore 100, 000 underscore feet underscore and today such flights are regularly made for upper air studies. In 1862, as Glacier and Coxwell reached the summit of underscore their highest flight, Glacier became unconscious. He recovered but two pigeons carried by the balloon died. Later, 1875, three men ascended much beyond 26,000 feet. Two died, it was soon evident that oxygen had to be provided, if men wished to survive at such altitudes. But another hazard was next encountered in man flights. Above about 40,000 feet, the fluids in the body begin to give off gas bubbles which lodge in the heart and elsewhere causing death. Hence pressurization is required, and this in turn means that a gondola capable of withstanding a considerable pressure difference is needed. Such a gondola, of which the first ones were spheres, is necessarily fairly heavy. The net result of experience with manned balloon aircraft ascents shows us that ordinarily, 24,000 feet may be taken as the maximum that men can survive without oxygen or pressurization. Physiology differs over quite, ride linets, and some Neapol can go quite a lot higher than others. Toward time top of any ascent without oxygen, the person begins to feel groggy, and his reactions are slow and inaccurate, so that his value in recording data is diminished. One of us, SAK, has been to 22,000 feet without oxygen in an unpressurized aircraft. His notes made at the top of this flight were very hard to decipher. On mountains, men have gone to higher elevations. However, here principal difference is that underscore acclimatization has occurred. If one underscore spends a week or so at several intermediate altitudes, underscore one can function quite well at 20,000 feet. One of us, SAK. Spent two weeks at 19,200 feet in Peru underscore in underscore 1934. Cyrular experiences are reported by the Everest climbers, among whose numbers a set of unusual records is to be found. Mallory and Irving were last seen climbing without oxygen at about 28,500 feet. Ennio Dell a few days later spent two underscore days at 26,000 feet. 10. E loaded porters have also climbed high without oxygen. It seems well established that performance is so much better when oxygen is used as to justify the extra weight and complication involved. A practical altitude limit for balloons is roughly 150,000 feet. He reason for this limit is that in an exponential atmosphere, to go higher acquires a balloon of absurdly large diameter. 
an instrument carrying rubber balloon in 1959 reached 146,000 feet, almost 28 miles, above New Jersey. The cost of the very large balloons, plus the difficulty of handling them on the ground, tends to present a practical limit. It should again be stated that there is no physical reason why this limit cannot be considerably exceeded if adequate financing and technique are available, yet because the costs and other problems are as they are, we today tend to think of 80,000 to 110,000 feet as balloon altitudes, elevations to which it is reasonable to expect balloons to go as a matter of routine. 1e. The uses of free balloons. IT is perhaps worthwhile briefly to summarize some of the many uses to which free balloons have been put. First, of course, is the scientific exploration of the upper atmosphere. To this end, balloons have carried aloft instruments to measure the temperature, pressure, humidity, the ozone content, the number and kinds of ions, tie spores carried by winds, atmospheric electricity and currents flowing in the atmosphere the potential gradient, the reflectivity of the earth and many other quantities which we require in order to understand the behavior of the atmosphere. Some of these experiments require recovery of the balloon, others yield at a which is readily adapted to telemetering. Other experiments in geophysics and cosmic physics have also been made with the aid of underscore balloons and these include such studies as that of the cosmic radiation, the strength of the earth's magnetic field, the ultraviolet content of sunlight, the nature of the particles causing the auroras the spectrum of the sun in the far ultraviolet, direct photographs of the sun and of the earth, and many other quantities. As a different use of balloons, they have served as platforms from which rockets have been launched, both the meteorological rockets designed to go to comparatively modest elevations such as the raccoons and also the larger ones such as used in Project Farside which ascended to much greater heights. By launching the rocket from a balloon, passage through the dense part of the Earth's atmosphere is avoided, and hence the achievable altitude can be increased by very much more than merely adding the height of the balloon, say 18 or 20 miles, to that height the rocket would reach were it fired from the surface. Small balloons have also been used to carry advertising and propaganda leaflets, which were released by automatic mechanisms at appropriate points. In sport, balloon jumping has been occasionally practiced. However, this sport has turned out to be far more dangerous, than one might at first imagine. The procedure usually is to get a balloon which will support most of one's weight, attach it to some sort of belt or harness, and then jump. For example if a man weighing 150 pounds is tied to a balloon having 140 pounds lift, he can jump very considerable distances. However three a number of accidents have occurred. One enthusiast dropped underscore a heavy camera, and as a result had a net upward buoyancy, presenting a difficult problem to his colleagues, and would probably have been killed had there not been a small plane available. Others have landed in high tension wires, and others similarly AA other places, causing enough inconvenience to themselves or to the community such that the sport has been officially discouraged. 13 Chapter 2 Types of Balloons 2A Extensible balloons Extensible balloons are made of some stretchable material, neoprene, is used at this writing, and are usually loosely spoken of as rubber ballo-ons. These balloons are made by Ape relying a neoprene film underscore on a mold whose size is smaller than the final balloon size. As soon as the film has gelled and before it is dry it is stripped from the form and inflated in th air to the correct size. The advantage of this method is that the resulting balloon is seamless. Certain balloons are plasticized to make them more resistant to temperature changes encountered in night flights. The Dewey and Almy Chemical Company of Cambridge, Massachusetts, the Pensnell manufacturer of rubber balloons, adds the letter P to the balloon designation to indicate that it has been plasticized for night and PX to those underscore balloons underscore which have received an extra amount equals of plasticization for use in the tropics. A new development on rubber low balloons is the constant level balloon. 
A valve system is used to release excess gas when the balloon reaches a preset altitude of from 10 to minus 30 kilometers. The whole balloon and valve assembly weighs between 400 and 2,000 grams and the payload capacity averages between I and 5 kilos. Because this balloon is so new, 1959, it is hard to evaluate IT probe for Y, underscore, but it has passed stringent military requirements according to the underscore manufacturer, and promises underscore to underscore make underscore constant level flight easier in dash the future. There are several types of rubber balloons, classified according to their most common use. The smallest kind of extensible balloon is called a ceiling balloon. It is used to calculate the height of a cloud ceiling, which, since the balloon rate of rise is known, is given by timing the balloon flight from release to disappearance into the clouds. A ceiling balloon may weigh 10 grams and have a diameter before inflation of 5 inches. The larger pilot balloons are tracked by observation through theodolites to give the wind velocity at various heights degrees again. Since the rate of rise is known if the amount of inflation is correct, the time elapsed since the launching gives the balloon altitude at any particular time. Since the theodolite gives the angles of azimuth and elevation subtended by the balloon at a given altitude, simple trigonometry yields the horizontal distance for a balloon from launching point. Using again the elapsed time one finds the balloon's horizontal, and thus the winds velocity at the given altitude. These pilot balloons can be fitted with a small battery operated light to make possible night tracking. In addition, these balloons come in four different colors, each of which is designed to contrast with a particular sky color associated with a particular meteorological situation. Load, carrying balloons, rubber or otherwise, are called sounding balloons. These are the ones which chiefly concern us here. 412 minus 154 typical sizes of the Dara balloons manufactured by Dewey and Ain, Y appear in table, 2 to 1. In addition to those balloons listed Darax is now making a new series, the J11 balloons equals which are roughly half as heavy as the J9 balloon which would be used to reach the same altitude. Underscore complete data are not yet available on this series. 2B Non-extensible balloons for many applications A balloon whose floating balance is as critical as is a rubber one, is useless. A rubber cell will keep rising until its particular bursting diameter is reached and then its usefulness is dash over unless a ballast system can be arranged underscore to float the balloon at some 3 or level. To do this is quite a problem. The cell has no inherent stability and loss is if buoyancy caused by diffusion of the lifting gas from the cell as well as buoyancy losses and gains produced by changes in the ambient temperate make it very difficult to maintain a constant balloon altitude, as meant in the preceding section, a recently developed valve arrangement seems to be solving this difficulty. Attempts to control the maximum balloon altitude underscore were made using neoprene and nylon shrouded neoprene cells with a nylon underscore covering limiting the volume to which the neoprene can expand. The rapid decay of neoprene when exposed to sunlight led people to experiment with non underscore extensible plastic cells to solve the constant level balloon problem. Such cells, when fully inflated at a certain altitude, have little tendency to rise any higher than that level. All right, that's it for this part of research ballooning. We leave off on page 24. If you like this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and share it with your friends. Also, feel free to visit my Patreon to support the production of these at patreon.com slash balloon science and visit my website if you like, stratosphericballoon.consulting. We'll leave you with the reading of the initial credits, which we skipped to get right into the text in the beginning. New York University College of Engineering Research Division Research Ballooning by Jermaine B. Beiser, Robert Cohane's Sir J. Korf Project Report Cosmic Ray Group Prepared for Nuclear Physics Branch 
Office of Naval Research Contract and Honor 28521 U. Percent National Committee for the International Geophysical Year. Projects 2017 and 2.18 December 1, 1959. 